Kapow Radio Show. Kapow. Hello. Hello. Is this thing on? You sound echoey. I'm not echoey. Just sounds echoey. Sounds weird. Weird. Weird, 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 weird. <laughs> welcome, Miss Kapow. Well, well welcome. Um, today is October 16th, 2017. And we're continuing in our psalm study, Psalm 3. And today we have Miss Kapow with us. Yay. Yay, yay, Hey, I want yay. you to know, though, that I, I listened to the last two shows, and they were very, very good. That's not what you told I, me. Well, I really enjoyed them. Okay. I think well. you did a great job, and I think you can do them all by yourself, so good night. Good night. <laughs> now, you're on the hook, dude. No, I do miss, I do miss it when I'm not here. I know you do. We're going to talk about Psalm 3, and here's how we're going to do it. Okay. Why don't you read Psalm 3, Okay. and then we're, we're going to go over and just start breaking everything down. Okay. Psalm 3, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul... There is no help for him in God, Selah. But thou, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill, Selah. I laid me down and slept. I awaked, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, For thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord, and thy blessing is upon thy people. 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 Selah. I said people. You said (laughs) people. Okay, so let's start off with some technical stuff here. All right. That I have to uh, get out. All righty. In your Bible, and I'm only using King James, so I don't know what the Jesuit Bibles do. I'm sure they, they do the same thing. Um, I don't know how it's worded. But in your Bible, above this particular psalm is the first time you will see a title. And the title reads, A Psalm of David When He Fled from Absalom, His Son. A Psalm of David When He Fled from Absalom, his son, period. And then the psalm, the scripture, the holy scripture inspired by God actually begins. Now, these titles, this is the first time that a title appears in the Psalms, in Psalm 3. And they appear for, I believe it's 13 other times. Yeah, there's 13 other Psalms that have titles. So we grew grew up our whole lives reading the Bible and seeing these titles over Psalms. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they tell you in advance what this particular Psalm is about. In this case, it's telling you What you're about to read is a Psalm of David when he fled from his son, Absalom. And that story is contained in 2 Samuel, you know, around chapter 15. 15. There's there's a lot of chapters that involve this whole story. It's it's a very interesting big story in itself. Yeah, it's like 15 through 19, something like that. Yes, great. I think it goes even before that, Ms. Cabal, where... um, Absalom is defending his sister, oh, okay. Tamar. So I think it even goes back further. So it, I, I want to say maybe chapters twelve all the way to nineteen or something. It's it's mm-hmm. big, mm-hmm. but they're talking about a particular incident, and I'm going to go over that where David had fled from Absalom, mm-hmm. and in his distress, fleeing, fleeing, this psalm was written about that. Okay. Mm-hmm. The point I want to make here is that as you're reading the Bible, you come across this title, a Psalm of David. It tells you David wrote it. 
when he fled from Absalom, his son, and why he wrote it, what part. So then you read the rest of the psalm that Ms. Kapal just read, and you go, huh, that's about David when he fled from Absalom. And if you're interested, you'll go back and look up that story and see what that was about. I would surmise most of us aren't that interested to go back and start reading Second Psalms to see what that's all about, in all honesty. Oh, Second Samuel. Sa- I'm sorry, Second Samuel. Thank you. In all honesty, most of us are not going to be that intrigued. So you're going to go right over it. You're going to go interesting. And then you're going to move on to Psalm 4 and 5 and, and just keep moving on. And you're going to miss, by doing that, you're going to miss what the Scripture has to say to you. Because the Scripture wasn't written by David. The Scripture was written by the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. The Scripture was written by God. These are God-breathed words. This is the words of God. And though he used human agents to pen, these are words of God, mm-hmm. not words of man. It's not words of David. We don't even know if David wrote this. And we certainly don't know if he wrote it because of the events contained in Second Samuel around chapter 15. But somebody's telling us that it is. Now, this viewpoint that I'm taking here, I don't know how many people have, are taking this viewpoint. It, it's kind of hard to find, but I don't trust. I don't trust anything that says it's always been this way. Don't question it. Because this isn't part of scripture. It's not part of, oh, it could be canonized. I don't care if a bunch of men canonized it. That means nothing to me. But it's not part of the psalm. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you, Ms. Kapow, what I'm trying to say? Yeah. To make myself perfectly clear, when we read the Psalms, we do not read this title that that tells us what it's about because we don't want to miss what it's really about. You understand? Mm -hmm. These Psalms many times are prophetic and they're messianic. And you're going to miss seeing Christ in them if you automatically think it's about David running from his son. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Basically, what what it does, it locks you in to a a mind frame of that title. And so you you don't really um, apply or think of the, the, the psalm as of Christ or how it relates to you and your relationship to him. Well said, perfectly said, it locks you in. It's just like if we start this show and I tell people this show was going to be about Psalm three. Well, we, then we start talking and whatever we say in their mind, it should relate to being about Psalm three. Mm -hmm. Even if we start talking about little green man on Mars, Mm -hmm. it locks you into what that person is talking about. So these titles, it was very interesting to go, huh, where did they come from? And like I said before, there's 13 of them. And just let me give you an example. There are 13 titles in the Psalms out of, out of the 150, right? Mm-hmm. And there's historical information associated with the composition of the Psalm. They give historical explanations Right, mm-hmm. they're they're not meant to give detailed account of how the psalm came to be written, but the titles are for the benefit of those who would use the psalm in worship. Some people say, you know, right. mm-hmm. to give that whole thing. Um, the the historical information will relate to events in the life of David. They always relate to that. Now, let me just go over and, t- and show you how many times, or, or some examples. I'm not going to give you all 13, but some examples of where they're at. Psalm 3 is the first time a title appears, and it's when David fled from Absalom, his son. So then you read the rest of the psalm, and you go, well, that's what it's about. Okay? Even though that's a great story and has a lot of meaning in itself, and maybe you could apply it to that and go, that's great. I do think... 
by accepting the title mentally, you're going to miss other meanings, right? Mm -hmm. I don't want to beat a dead horse. I just feel like I need to really make that clear. Right. I'm against titles, okay? I do not like the titles. Maybe I'm the only one in the world. Uh, Miss Capato don't like them either. So maybe we're the only ones in the world that see it like this. But I don't like it. And I'm going to tell you, Psalm 3 is the first time it shows up. Psalm 7 is another one. It says, which he, David, sang to Yahweh concerning the words of Cush, a Benjamite. We don't know if that's true. Psalm 52, when Doeg, the Edomite, went and told Saul and said to him, David has gone to the house of Ahimelech. Uh, Psalm 54, when the Zephites went and said to Saul, is not David hiding with us? Psalm 56, when the Philistines captured him, David and Gath. Mm -hmm. Psalm 57, when he, David, fled the Psalm into the cave. Okay, ad nauseum. You get my point. They go on and on and on. There's 13 issues of this, giving historical information that may or may not be accurate. And I'm not the only one who's noticed this. Many times when you go, and we'll see this in Psalm 3, you go to the history, it's, it, there's inconsistencies in that history with the psalm. And you'll see in Psalm 3 that we're going we're gonna to deal with and that Ms. Kapow just read, is there any mention of any of this? Absalom or anything? Mm -mm. And I'm going to show you where there's even a, not only an inconsistency, but a direct opposition to what David was experiencing in 2 Samuel 15 and what the psalm actually says. I mean, direct opposite. Now, with regard to the authority of the, we, these are called titles, by the way. They're called titles. There are different opinions on the subject by scholars, different opinions. And some people, like me, there's some scholars that want to omit them altogether. And I, I'm for that. I think they should be omitted. I don't think anything should be added to the word of God. And in many instances, these titles are inconsistent with the subject matter of the psalm itself. Now, you go back to the early church fathers, Augustine, Theodoret, various other early writers of the, of the Christian church. And Augustine uh, is not one of my favorite people anyway. <laughs> mm -hmm. And Theodoret, who's him, right? Who is he? Uh, they regarded them as part of the inspired text. And the Jews still continue to make them a part of their chant. And the rabbis comment on them, right? Mm -hmm. But we're not following Judaism, are we? And it's unknown. Now, here's, here's the kicker, people. You have to understand this. This is what should raise your hackles and your suspicions about altered Bibles. It's unknown who invented or placed them where they are. Red flag? Mm-hmm. Don't you think we should know who put these titles above the Psalms that are leading us to believe a certain way when we read it? Yep. I think it's important. Mm -hmm. I really do. But it's unknown. It's lost. How do, how do we not know that? Right. There, it's not part of the Psalm. They're titles that are telling you what the Psalm was about. No one knows where, where they came from. But I will tell you this. They're not in the Hebrew text. Uh-oh. They came... But they came about in the Septuagint. It's unquestionable that they've been so placed from as long as we can remember, uh, you know, the scrolls, the scriptures. And they occur in the Septuagint. And the Septuagint contains a few instances uh, of titles to Psalms that are without any in the Hebrew. And they were copied after the Septuagint by Jerome. You get you you see where I'm going? Yeah. Catholic Jerome. So there is a obscurity. There's an obscurity that hangs over these titles, and uh, I, that makes me very suspicious. Doesn't not you? Mm -hmm. Here's the other thing I want to bring about. And then I'll get off this, this horse here, but 
there's these these prefixed inscriptions, like I said, um, and they 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 talk about all this stuff. And sometimes, like I said, they're inconsistent with the contents. But there have been many translators who just keep putting these in there. Mm-hmm. And the inscriptions, even though they're very old, they're obscure. They are obscure and people don't, I mean, there's no, we don't know where they came from. And that makes me suspicious because it seems like a man is trying to guide me into that thought. All right. Mm-hmm. So I think that's all I have to say about that. I would highly recommend, and you do whatever you want because it doesn't, you know, it, it, you're not going to hurt my feelings. But I would recommend when you read the Psalms, ignore those titles and read the words for what they are. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah, I've been doing that for for years now since we lived in um, California in yeah. Emmett, and it really does it really does open up the scripture. It does, and it's not just the Psalms. There's other places in the Bible where the translators, Proverbs. yeah, the translators have put these little titles, these little quips, telling you what you're about to read. You know, you read the New Testament, it says, Jesus goes down and heals the, you know, the Gadarene. And so then you go, well, from here on out, I'm reading about Jesus healing the Gadarene. And there, there's a whole lot there you miss, mentally. I don't know, I just don't like it. All right? I don't like it! Ah, uh, here you Get rid of the titles. Get rid of them. Okay, so let's get into the scripture itself. All right. These are the words of God. Hello, this is Professor Lamsrap from the Institute of Prophetic Studies in Southern California. Are you tired of going to church, yet getting nothing from it? Do you feel good on Sunday, but defeated by Monday? Does your church fail to equip you with the necessary tools to live out your Christianity? And does your church leave you powerless? Have you ever wondered why? Well, you are not alone. I strongly suggest you read Eyes to See Unseen Enemies by Paul and Linda Villanueva. This book examines and explains the problems with so many of today's churches and ministries. You will learn about the false spirits invading churches and the occult practices that have crept into the house of God. More importantly, you will get the tools needed to protect yourself and the ones you love. Eyes to See Unseen Enemies is available at all online digital book retailers such as Amazon, iBooks, and Barnes & Noble. Go to fifthhookmedia.com, F-I-F-T-H-O-O-K-M-E-D-I-A.com for further information. This is Professor Lamsrath, and I am making Eyes to See Unseen Enemies required reading in all of my courses. So I'll see you in class. Ms. Kapow, you want to uh, open up with what you got? Oh, okay. Well, when I did a study on in Psalms 3... What I saw was the actual gospel. And what I mean by that is, like the very first scripture, it says, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. To me, that meant, um, the way I took it, is like uh, personally, the, the three enemies that the Christians face is our flesh, the world, and Satan. And if we look at the scriptures, in 1 John it says, uh, Love not the world or the things in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world will pass away, and the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God abides forever. And then in James, it says, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is enemy of God. Second Peter says, dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against your soul. And um, Romans 7 is also about the, the flesh. Now then, it is more than that I do it, but sin that dwelleth in me, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would do, 
I do not, but the evil which I would not do, that I do. And the other one, the other enemy that we have is Satan. And John 10.10 says, The thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And I come that they might have life, and that they might have life more abundantly. And then in 1 Peter 5.8 it says, Be sober and be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. So the very first scripture that reads, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Every day we're faced with the things of the world, our flesh, and Satan. So there are many enemies and troubles that come against us. And verse 2 says, Many there be which say of my soul, There is no help for him in God. And it takes me back to the scripture Well, the very first one is with the Lord Jesus as he's hanging on the cross. And there's a lot of spectators, you know, Mm -hmm. because here this guy said, here Jesus said that I am the son of God. And here he is hanging on the cross. He did many, many miracles. And so there are people there that are just spectators. They're just watching to see what could happen. And as Jesus is saying something, they can't really understand what he's saying and, they go, and somebody wants to go give him something to drink. And somebody else says, no, 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 let's go see. I think he said Elijah's going to save him or something, right? Mm-hmm. They're causing all this stir. So there's unbelievers there that don't believe that God will save this man, this man that, who says that he, he is the son of God. And then the other one is where Jesus is talking um, amongst his disciples and stuff. And this rich man comes and asks Jesus, what he could do to get eternal life. And Jesus looked at him and said, um, "If to get eternal life, you must do the commandments. And so this person says, well, this is what I do, blah, 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 blah. And Jesus says, that's good. But one thing you lack, why don't you sell all your, your, your possessions and give to the poor and then come follow me? And the rich man said, and the scripture says that the rich man was very, very sad because he had many riches. And so he left the Lord sad. He couldn't do that. And Jesus said basically that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And so his disciples said, Lord, we left everything. Who, who, who can be saved? Right? But Jesus said, with man, it's impossible. But with God... It's possible. So here it says, Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. And how many times have we been in situations, in hopeless, hopeless situations, where only only God can help us. But the world will say, God's not helping you. God's, there's no help in God. That, that's just a crutch. There's, you know, God's power is nothing. <clears throat> Third uh, scripture says, But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of mine head. And I go down to, um, let's see, where do I go? Romans ten thirteen, where it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then when you, he says, I cried unto the Lord my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. So we know that when... Even like before we became Christians, when we came to the lowest part in our life where the things of this world and things in our lives was um, depressing us and making us hopeless, when we saw there was, no, there was no hope, there was no answer for us, when we called out to Jesus, he came and he heard us and th- our lives changed after that. So now it says, I laid me down and slept, and I awaked, for the Lord sustained sustained me. And we find that in Romans 6, 4, it says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also should we walk in the newness of life. So when we, before our salvation, and we cried out unto the Lord, and he heard us. We had died with Christ, and he gave us of his life. He gave us a new life in him. So we were baptized into his death. 
so that we could be raised up into newness of life. Verse 6 says, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me around about. After we have died or been baptized in the death of Jesus and we have risen, how much more do we see problems and troubles? There, we have a whole new set of troubles because now we've become a greater target for the enemy. And basically, we actually see and understand who the enemy is of our soul, whereas before we, we do not know that. So in verse 6 says, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. We go to Ephesians 6.12 that says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, and it, but against principalities, against powers, and against rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. John 4.4 4 says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So now that we have died and we've raised with Christ, God gave us, he made us new creatures in Christ Jesus, and he's <clears throat> given us the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is greater than our enemies, which are the world, the flesh, and Satan. And in Colossians 2.10 or 2, 9 through 10 says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. So we are seated in the heavenlies with Christ, and we are complete in him. So we are lacking nothing. Then verse 7 says, Arise, O Lord, and save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all my enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth, of the ungodly. And we go to Colossians 2.15 and says that Jesus, he has spoiled the principalities and powers and he made a show of them openly, triumphant thing over them. And then verse 8 says, Salvation belongeth to the Lord, thy blessing is upon thy people. And if we go to Ephesians 3.6, let's see. Actually, let's go to um, Ephesians 6 through 9. It says, um, for the, the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his prom, promise in the, gos, in the Christ by the gospel. And let me read that over again. That the Gentiles, Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Verse 9 says, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath made been hidden God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now into the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal promise which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. So because of the Lord Jesus Christ, his blood has reconciled us to God. And through his resurrection, we are alive now unto God. And these are promises that we receive these are these this is our inheritance in Christ and remember in Isaiah 54:17 says no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn and this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and the righteousness of is of me saith the Lord which is amazingly it is beautiful that his righteousness not our righteousness but his righteousness from the Lord is what we have. That's what we. That's what we are inheriting. So this this psalm to me is the gospel. And you know what? All of that would have been missed had you just read it in light of the historical title that was given it. Mm-hmm. Seriously. Now, I understand that you can take scripture and do a application. You know, you can apply it to your life. You can apply it to certain things. And that's what you did. You applied it, right? Mm -hmm. However, it goes much more deeper than just applying it. It's what the scripture is saying. It's not like you're taking, well, the story of Absalom and then applying it. 
you're taking the real scripture and saying, this is what it's saying, because that's what it says. There's enemies all about us, but God is our shield and our protector, right? Mm -hmm. And when you think that it's just David running from Absalom, you miss all that. Now, do an experiment and look at um, some commentaries that you might have. And you'll see within Psalm 3, there's very little commentary. There's maybe two or three paragraphs. And you know why? Because they have the mindset that it's about a historical thing. So why repeat it? Just mm-hmm. read Second Samuel, right? Mm-hmm. So they don't go into great detail because they don't see the great detail. That's the point. So you're absolutely correct. The enemies are all around us. And this is not only uh, applies to like your everyday life. This is prophetic for the times we live in now. Mm -hmm. Folks, we are surrounded by serpents. And I'm not talking just politicians and celebrities. I'm talking about people around you. There's serpent seed everywhere. And this is, is. yes. What's that? There really is. Yes. And this is the time where many people, many of these serpents are saying, they're saying to you, there's no help from God. Why believe in God? Those are mockers and scoffers, right? Mm -hmm. But this Psalm is saying that, that God is your shield. He's going to lift you up. You can go to sleep and you're going to wake because God is going to protect you and sustain you during that night. Right. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to be afraid of 10,000s of people that that come against you because you have God. This is huge. Mm -hmm. If you just think this is about David at a historical thing, you read right over it. But this is this applies to you. It applied to Messiah when he was here on earth and it applies to us. Mm -hmm. And in verse seven, what I want to point out where it says, arise, O Lord. It's it's like figuratively represented as God being asleep to note to denote his apparent indifference. Like in Psalm 7, 6, it says, Arise, O Lord, in thy anger. Lift up thyself because of the rage of mine enemies, and awake for me to the judgment that thou hast commanded. And that should be our prayer. Mm-hmm. You look around this crazy world we live in how it's collapsing or falling apart, and we should be hastening the coming of God. That's the manner of speech we should be having, according to Peter 3.8. Mm-hmm. What manner of, of, of speech and conduct should we have then? If all these great things are happening, the day of the Lord is a great darkness, right? It's a day of clouds and darkness and of judgment. What manner of speech and behavior should we have? Mm-hmm. This is it. Because of the rage of the enemies. Awake. God, awake and rise up into the judgment that you've commanded. Right. Let's get on with it. Let's do it. The other thing is God has smitten all. The writer says, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. The cheekbone. And I want you to understand enemies. It's an adversary. It's an enemy. It's a foe. And I'm going to read to you in a bit the Samuel part about Absalom and you're going to see that David did not consider his son an enemy mm-hmm. <laughs> at all and he would never have prayed this against his own son even though his son tried to take the kingship from him he never would have prayed this prayer that's why I don't believe in that title so this writer of the psalm says arise O Lord save me O my God for thou hast smitten all my enemies upon the cheek bone Mm -hmm. upon the cheekbone the use of cheekbone and teeth represents the enemies they're fierce like wild beasts ready to devour psalm 27 2 says when the wicked even mine enemies and my foes come upon me to eat up my flesh Mm -hmm. they stumbled and fell that's spiritual cannibalism is it not Mm mm-hmm and smiting the cheekbone. First Kings twenty two twenty four says, But Zedekiah the son of Chananana <laughs> Chananana went near and smote Micaiah on the cheek, just slapped him, just went smack and said, 
which way went the spirit of the Lord for me to speak unto you? Mm. It denotes violence and insult. So the author of this psalm is saying, Arise, O God, wake up and um, save me. And then it's past tense. You've smitten. You, you've, you've already smacked my enemies upon the cheek. You, and then you have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Breaking the teeth. Breaking the teeth. Uh, it's utterly depriving the enemy of power to injure. That's what that is. They can't bite you. They can't hurt you. You break the teeth of the ungodly because salvation belongs to God. And what Ms. Kapow just talked about, how this denotes salvation. You see the salvation. The blessing is upon thy people, mm-hmm. not the curse. The blessing is upon thy people. Yeah, what you were just talking about, that we, you know, the authority that we have in Christ, you know, we have that in, we read that in Luke. 19 and then or 10 19 and then we read that also in um mark 16 Mm -hmm. yes we have that authority because christ has already done that right he's already broken the teeth of the enemy Mm -hmm. he's already slapped him on the cheek we're just waiting like that psalm says we're just waiting for him to do the judgment that he's commanded okay so let's let's go and look at second samuel 15 i'm not going to read all of this to you it's a huge story if you're not familiar with it, basically, the eldest son of King David of Israel, uh, there was uh, he had several sons, and uh, there was a daughter named T- uh, Tamar. Mm-hmm. And one of David's sons, I forget his name right now, uh, H- Hanan. Anyway, he he uh, he raped Tamar. He mm-hmm. had sexual relations with his sister. So Absalom, the oldest son wanted uh, King David to do justice on that, vengeance on that. And David didn't. Uh, There was a time in Israel's uh, government under King David where he did have several wives. He had concubines. He had things. He did stuff that he wasn't supposed to do either. And his judgment kind of fell fell apart Mm -hmm. uh, through all the wars and civil strifes. There was a lot of different civil strifes and things like that. And this was a time where... um, you know, whatever reason, it was his own son or whatever, he protected him and he didn't do judgment. So a couple of years had passed and Absalom saw that his father uh, wasn't going to do righteous judgment. And Absalom was right on this. You know, he was absolutely right. He saw it mis- misjudgment. And so he took matters of his own hands and he set up this deal, this um, this little dinner thing with all the sons and everything. And so he had his servants go and kill that brother. So he killed him, and then because of that, he had to flee, and he was gone for a couple of years in hiding. And um, so through some negotiation, stuff like that, he was able to come back to Jerusalem. So he comes back to Jerusalem, and for uh, like four years that he's in Jerusalem, uh, David won't talk to him, and Mm -hmm. he can't can't get a meeting to talk to his own dad. So the the Absalom kind of snaps, you know? And uh, he's a real good looking guy. All Israel digs him. You know, he's he's charming the whole bit. He kind of snaps and says, I'm going to I'm going to rebel and upsert and take over my dad's kingdom. That's Mm -hmm. that's basically the story. So that's what you have. And that's that's what they're saying. This psalm's about. So what happens in Second Samuel, chapter 15, it says, and it came to pass after this, Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. So it's it's he's regal. He's treated himself as royalty. He's a king's son. And he rose up early. He stood beside the way of the gate. You know, that's where the judgment seat is. And it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, of what city art thou? And he said, thou servant is of, of one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, see, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed uh, of the king to hear thee. So he's playing a politician. He's saying, um, you know, you have valid arguments, you have a valid case, but if you go to the king, there's no one going to listen to you. There's there's no one going to listen to you. And here he is sitting in the gate with all royalty and, and, and regalness. And Absalom said, moreover, that I were made judge. You know, if you vote for me, mm-hmm. if you vote for me, I'm going to do this, this, and this, and this, and this. Vote for me on election day. That's what yeah. he's saying. <laughs> really, it's, it's nothing's new under the sun. 
So he says, oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. Mm-hmm. Oh, if you just elect me. Mm-hmm. If you just elect me, I'll get rid of this and get change this. And man, we won't, you know, we would tax, tax, tax. We won't have the taxes. And, oh. And verse five, it says, and it was so that when any man came near to him to do um, obscience, you know, they bowed down to his royalty. Mm-hmm. He put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. Mm-hmm. Wow. What a great guy. What a politician. And he was really good looking too. He had this this long, long hair. Apparently, he had to cut it once a year. Yeah, and it weighed something like two shekels or something like that. That's pretty heavy. Yeah, and he had just like rock star hair, and he was just like, like really good looking dude. And uh, so people started digging him, and it said that, um, and on this matter did Absalom to all Israel, all the people of Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Mm. The word stole. Wow. In Hebrew, it really means thieve, to deceive or carry away, to steal by stealth. Just like a politician, right? Mm -hmm. So after it came to pass, the King James says 40 years, but uh, most scholars believe that is a mistranslation. Uh, Because even Josephus says four years after four years, which would make more sense that, you know, he didn't do this for 40 years. Okay. So uh, there's a problem there uh, in a, in a translation. Absalom said unto the king, I pray thee, let me go and pay my vow. Anyway, he wanted to go to Hebron and stuff. So he did all this deceit. So what he does is he gets a bunch of people together and um, he says, uh, you know, I want you to announce that I'm, I'm king. And the story goes on and on. And I'm already like in the 18th chapter here, you know, where he then rebels and he has all this people and stuff. And um, so what happens is Israel goes to war against the people that are with David. David has to flee Jerusalem and he takes his wives. He leaves a few of his concubines there to run the house and he has to he has to run. And so why he's, you know, hiding in the wilderness or something like that. That's why they say, well, you know, he's so distressed over Absalom. That's when he wrote this psalm, Psalm 3, right? Mm -hmm. But I want to show you something. Uh, In verse 14, chapter 18 says, uh, then Joab, this was um, one of David's commanders, you know, uh, big mighty men. Then uh, said Joab, I may not tarry thus with these, talking to some guy who, who said that he saw Absalom hanging from a tree. What happened is Absalom, uh, the 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 a bunch of people got killed in this civil war mm-hmm. a bunch of people got killed and um let me go back here my goodness uh let, let, okay let me go back here verse 5 i don't know why it skipped it i have no idea and the king commanded joab and abashai and a tie saying when they do this battle, deal gently for my sake with the young man, even with Absalom. Mm. And all the people heard when the king gave all the captains charge concerning Absalom. So does this sound like a guy who wrote Psalm 3 saying, break the teeth of my enemies? No. He's saying, when you go out to war and you and you fight, for my kingdom. Do you get it? Mm-hmm. It's the kingdom of Israel and all Israel's against David. And David has a handful of people, mighty men that are around him. When you fight for my kingdom and for what's right, don't hurt my enemy, my son. Mm-hmm. It doesn't sound like Psalm 3. No. It doesn't sound like breaking the teeth and smiting the cheekbone. Rise up, O oh God, against my enemies. The Absalom was not looked at as an enemy to David. And so the people went out into the field against Israel, and the battle was in the wood of Ephraim, where the people of Israel were slain before the servants of David. So Israel was losing. The followers of Absalom were losing, and there was a great slaughter that day of 20,000 men. Mm. And um, because the battle was, was in the country, the wood devoured more people than the sword. In other words, they just they died in the forest, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, more than the sword. And Absalom met the servants of David. 
And so he's running from them and he rode upon a mule, not a horse, not a donkey, but a mule. Mm. And the mule went under a thick bow of, of great oak. There's a big tree and his head, his hair got hold of the oak and he was taken up between the heaven and the earth. He was caught in a tree and then the mule that was under him ran away. So there he is just dangling from the tree, Absalom, the guy that would be king, and he couldn't do anything. He's just hanging there by his head of his hair. Mm. Wow. So this guy sees him. Anyway, the story goes on, and but he wouldn't touch him because he hurt, he knew the king said, don't hurt, don't hurt my son. That's right. So he wouldn't do it. So he goes, he tells Joab, and Joab like is mad because he, he didn't do anything. And so in verse 14, he says, and he, and so Joab takes three darts in his hand and he thrusts them through the heart of Absalom Ouch. while he was yet alive in the midst of the oak, Mm-mm. right? He kills the king's son. And then 10 young men that bear Joab's armor went around and smote Absalom and slew him. Mm-hmm. So they killed him. And not only that, Joab then blew the trumpet and the people returned from pursuing after Israel. The, the Absalom is dead. There's no more rebellion. It's over with. Mm-mm. And Joab held back the people from killing the rest of Israel. Wow. So, and then verse 17, they took Absalom, they cast him into a great pit in the wood. They laid a bunch of stones on him. And then Israel fled everyone to his own tent. They just went, Whoa, uh-oh, uh-oh, <laughs> that coup didn't work, right? Mm-hmm. So he's dead, right? He's dead. Um, let me go. Da, 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 da. <sighs> Let me find this here. So he's dead. And so Joab, Joab is talking to one of the uh, sons of the priest who wants to go and tell the king the news. And he says, no, he says, not today because it's not good tidings, you know. And so he sends another man. But anyway, Zadok outruns him. It's a whole story or whatever. But we're going to go to uh, verse 28 of chapter 18. And one of the runners, his name is uh, Ahimaaz. He called and he said unto the king, he ran to the king, David. And he said, all is well. And he fell down to the earth upon his face before the king. And he said, blessed be the Lord thy God, which hath delivered up the men that lifted up their hand against my Lord the king. Mm -hmm. Right? And David says to him, Is the young man Absalom safe? Hmm. Now, does that sound like Psalm 3? Mm -mm. Do you still have Psalm 3 in front of you? Uh, No, but I can pull it up. That's all right. Just just be reminded of that very last, uh, I think it's verse 7, where it says you have smitten Mm -hmm. the cheek of my enemy and broke his teeth. Does this sound like a man who wants that to happen to his son Absalom? Does he look at Absalom as a enemy? Mm -mm. I'm just trying to prove a point here that these titles are bunk. That's what I'm trying to tell you. And the king said, is the young man Absalom safe? And Ahmas answered, you know, I saw, he says, look it. I saw a great tumult, a great battle. Mm Mm-hmm. But I do not what it was. So I, I, I really don't know. And the king said unto him, well, just stand there and just be still. And then the other messenger came, right? Cushy came mm-hmm. to bring tidings. And he said, tidings, my lord, the king. So there's two messengers. So the one guy says, I don't know. I just saw a great battle. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know anything beyond that. But I know that we won. <laughs> but I, I, I can't tell you about your son. And so the other guy says, Tidings, my lord, the king, for the Lord hath avenged thee this day of all them that rose up against thee. Right? Mm-hmm. That's Israel who rose up against David. Mm-hmm. And so the king, David, this is verse 32, said unto Cushi, is the young man Absalom safe? That's clear as a bell. He's talking about his son, Absalom, who rebelled against him, who wanted to take the kingdom from him right. and destroy David's kingdom. And so David is, is the young man Absalom safe? Is my son safe? And Cushy answered, the enemies of my Lord, the king, and all that rise against thee to do thee hurt, be as that young man is. Mm-hmm. <gasps> yeah. 
Oh, so he's dead as a doornail, slaughtered and torn to pizzas and buried in a pit under rock. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And in verse 33, David was much moved and he went up to the chamber over the gate and wept as he went. And thus he said, oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, would God I had died for thee. Oh, Mm -hmm. Absalom, my son, my son. Wow. So what David is saying, I wish God would have killed me the anointed king of Israel, and let you, the rebellious son, live. Mm -mm. Wow. Now, does that sound like Psalm 3? Mm -mm. Does that sound like smite my enemies in the cheek and break his teeth? Nope. No. No. And yet, this psalm is ascribed to this incident. All right? Mm -hmm. Chapter 19, and it was told Joab, behold, the king weeps and mourns for Absalom. And the victory that day was turned into mourning unto all the people. For the people heard say that day how the king was grieved for his son. And then they all, like, just like they were ashamed and they all just went to their homes, right? Yeah. And the king cried and covered his face. He kept saying, oh, my son, Absalom, my son, Absalom, my son, Absalom. Now, check this out. In verse 5, Joab, the guy who killed the king's son, came to David and chewed him out. And he said, Thou hast shamed this day the faces of all thy servants, which this day have saved your life Mm. and the lives of your sons and your daughters and the lives of your wives and the lives of your concubines, in that thou lovest thine enemies. Mm. Does that sound like Psalm 3? Mm Mm-mm. The guy who wrote Psalm 3, did he love his enemies? Nope. He's asking God to raise a shield and to protect him. He's he's praying to God to rise up against his enemies. This is not that story. So Absalom says, In that thou lovest thine enemies and hateth thy friends? For thou hast declared this day that thou regardest neither princes nor servants. For this day I perceive that if Absalom had lived... And all we had died this day, then it had pleased you well. Mm. In other wow. words, you would have rather had all of the kingdom of, of Israel just, just dead mm-hmm. and have this rebellious son take king, and then you would have been happy. And so Joab continues to chastise David, and he says, Now, therefore, get up, go forth, and speak comfortably. In other words, speak some good words out of your heart unto your servants, your people. He says, for I swear by the Lord, if thou go not forth, there will not tarry one with thee this night, and that will be worse unto thee than all the evil that befell thee from thy youth until now. Ouch. In other words, if you don't comfort the people and you sit around mourning for an enemy that tried to destroy the kingdom, then they're all going to rebel against you. Mm Mm-hmm. And so then David arose and sat by the gate and he told the people, behold, the king sits in the gate and they came before the king and, and, uh, for Israel had fled every man to his tent, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but there was still a lot of strife. Okay. So I just wanted to, I just really wanted to reiterate that point. And let me go back to Psalm three, one, three, one. You know, and he says, I, you know, I cried out with my voice. Um, I will not be afraid of 10,000 people. Yeah, of course, all that can apply, but not verse seven. Arise, O Lord, save me. Oh my God. What does that mean? Save me, but um, don't hurt my enemies. Mm-mm. Oh, Absalom, Absalom, I wish I would have died instead of you. That, that's not what it says. He says, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone and hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Would he have called his own son Absalom ungodly at that point? Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. He says, salvation belongeth unto the Lord. The blessing is upon thy people. In other words, my own son is not blessed. He's going to die and go to hell. Um, I don't think so. So you read that title, A Psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. I think it's just total, it's total fabrication. And I suspect the reason why is that it takes away from what Ms. Kapow just taught. Yeah, the true salvation. Sal- the, 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 true, the true gospel, yeah. The salvation of Jesus Christ, you know. Um, anything else you want to add to that, Ms. Kapow? No, I think that's it for me. Okay, then let's say goodnight and we'll talk to you guys later. Ciao, babies. 